Now, butternut squash is a pretty hardy vegetable. That one really is dense. Growing up, like most kids, I hated vegetables. Broccoli or cabbage or green beans. When I got into the cooking game, I learned a few techniques that made veggies taste great. But they were always the sideshow to the main attraction of a big piece of meat. One of the first cookbooks I worked on at ATK was the vegan book. And I was challenged to turn vegetables themselves into the centerpiece rather than the afterthoughts. Given what I knew about cooking vegetables, I was skeptical to say the least. Through my work, I proved myself wrong. Veggies can be every bit as complex and exciting as proteins. And there's a lot more to skillful veggie cooking than I realized. Today, we're gonna cook three of my favorite vegetable dishes and learn how to take veggies from side dish to main course. Hit that like button down below, then let's get cracking. Before we start going wild turning veggies into main courses, I'm gonna show you how to make the dish that transformed my relationship with vegetables. This roasted broccoli is a great example of textbook vegetable cooking. Here's why it works so well. First, you place a large rimmed baking sheet on the lowest rack of an oven and preheat the oven to 500 degrees. Cut a large head of broccoli, about one and three quarter pounds, at the junction between the florets and the stalks. Remove the outer peel from those stalks. You can use a peeler or a knife. Cut the stalk into two to three inch lengths and cut each length into half inch thick pieces. Cut the crown into six wedges and then toss with three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Make sure it's well coated. Then add a half teaspoon of sugar and a half teaspoon of salt and a little bit of pepper. The sugar won't make it sweet. It'll just give you some better browning through caramelization. Remove the baking sheet from the oven and carefully transfer the broccoli to the baking sheet and spread into an even layer, placing the flat sides down. Return the baking sheet to the oven and roast until the stalks are well browned and tender and the florets are lightly browned. That'll take about 10 minutes. This is looking so good. Let's tuck in. Oh. I'm gonna grab some of the stalk. Now, I love the fact that this recipe doesn't waste any of the stalk, because normally it tells you to throw it away. Here, we're eating all of it. Mm. The first thing you taste is that browning. And this is so much better than if you're just to toss a whole lot of chopped broccoli straight into an oven on a cold sheet pan. That blast of hot heat from the bottom oven rack with the preheated baking sheet in a 500 degree oven means all the heat's directed to the underside of the broccoli whilst the top side gently steams and can stay crisp, tender, and bright green. So you're really introducing a lot of different textures and flavors to just a single vegetable. But this broccoli doesn't really feel like the star of the meal, like a piece of fish or a piece of meat would. So for our vegetable main courses, we took what we knew about cooking vegetables and started to prepare them almost as if they're proteins. Let's get going on some chili rubbed butternut squash steaks. Not all vegetables are created equal. You could use our broccoli roasting technique to roast cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, but starchy vegetables like this squash are dense so they need to be treated a little bit differently. When cooked properly, that dense sweetness will give us a meaty bite and it can handle bold seasonings much like you put on a steak. You could cut these squash into little pieces and then roast them at a slightly lower temperature so that the sugars don't burn. But for that full meal feeling, they need to be bigger and more impressive. I've got two three pound butternut squashes here and to fabricate our steaks, I'm gonna separate the base from the neck. And we're gonna save the bases for another use. You could roast them to make a, a salad, or you could put them into a soup or a stock. So I'm gonna take off the top of the squash, and now we need to peel it. And you could use a vegetable peeler, but I just find a sharp chef's knife does the job really well. So you just wanna run your knife down the outside of the squash, and you really wanna peel away anything that isn't bright orange. The light yellow flesh is really quite starchy and stringy, and it doesn't taste good. So you really wanna cut down to the orange bits. So now we're gonna cut this lengthwise in half. So I'm just gonna lay it on its side and I've got some flat surfaces here from the skin I peeled off. I'm just gonna cut right down the middle. It gives me a lot of stability here. We've got all that flat surface, which is what we're gonna to use to pick up that browning. Now we need to cut these into three quarter inch thick steaks. I'm just gonna hold it down here with my fingers slightly above the blade. So if my knife slips, it's gonna slip down, not up. I'm just gonna gently start working my way into the flesh. And then once I'm in a little bit, I can push down and I've safely got a nice three quarter inch thick slab. 
And I'll repeat this with the rest of my squash. So now I've got four steaks and the rest of this is trim, which you absolutely do want to save for another use. During recipe development, we tried roasting these steaks in different ways. Now the first was the simplest. We just covered them in a little bit of olive oil, added some salt and pepper, and roasted them in a 400 degree oven until they were done. That was a total failure. The outsides turned tough and leathery well before the inside was cooked. It was still raw. Then we tried cooking them like we would a steak. We seared them first in a hot pan and then finished them off in the oven until they were cooked through. Now that gave us a really well cooked interior. It was soft and sweet and fudgy, but the exterior turned soggy in the amount of time it took for the interior to cook through. It was kind of unappealing. We wanted a nice crispy crust, much like a steak would have. So we decided to flip the process. We're gonna cook them in the oven first until they're tender and then sear them in a hot pan to get that crust. Now this reverse sear method is something we very often do with thicker cuts of steak to make sure they're cooked evenly. The added bonus of this was the surface moisture of the steaks would evaporate in the oven, which would then give you a better sear later. And that's when we had the idea to score the surfaces of the steaks into a crosshatch pattern. Crosshatching is very often used in meat cooking to help render the fat and make it crispier. Making those shallow incisions in the surface of the vegetable dries out the surface better, which will promote evaporation and browning, and it allows for better flavor penetration for our spice rub. The recipe still works if you don't do the crosshatching, but we found during testing that the browning won't be as even or the crust as crisp. Now I'm really not going that deep. You really just want to cut into the surface. And you can see I'm sort of doing them at like a 10 o'clock and a two o'clock angle. Now I'm gonna transfer these to a rim baking sheet and we're gonna make a Southwestern spice rub. I've got two teaspoons of smoked paprika here, two teaspoons of sugar, a teaspoon and a half of salt, a teaspoon of garlic powder, half a teaspoon of chipotle chili powder. So this along with the smoked paprika will give us that really smoky flavor. Half a teaspoon of black pepper and we're gonna bind it all together with three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Now this spice rub goes really well on a steak too. You've got so much bold flavor there, all balanced out with that little bit of sugar and a little bit of seasoning from the salt. We're gonna brush our steaks with this spice mixture. Butternut squash is naturally very sweet and a little bit earthy, and this really takes it in a robustly savory direction. All right, these are ready to go in the oven. We're gonna roast these on the middle rack of a 450 degree oven until the steak is almost completely tender. It'll take about 15 minutes. So notice we're not using a preheated baking sheet here and we're raising the steaks off the hot metal using a rack. So it's been 15 minutes now. I'm gonna make sure they're nice and tender. Yep, just so. I'm preheating one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil in a 12 inch nonstick skillet over medium high heat until it's just smoking because the squash is almost fully cooked through. We just want to sear the outsides. We're gonna cook these until they're well browned and crisp which will take about three minutes aside, and then we'll be ready to eat. Okay, these are looking fantastic. Let's get them onto the platter. Notice I'm using two spatulas here. This really gives you so much more control when you're dealing with food that could be a little bit delicate. Oh, you get these lovely little bubbly edges. And you can just see the spices where they've bloomed. They've given so much of their flavor and it just smells amazing. So these spicy steaks go really well with a cooling ranch. Now I've got a vegan version here, but actually you could use something straight from the bottle. Now you could pour this on top, but I like to get a little chefy and then just make a little swoosh around the bottom. And that way, as you swipe the squash through it, you get so much of that flavor. And take this front one that looks lovely, put it on our swoosh. Mm. It's so great straight from the pan because you get that textural contrast. It's so satisfying and we're one step closer to that main course feeling. But next, we're gonna kick it up a notch and make a dish that can serve as a centerpiece to any meal, whole roasted Romanesco. Romanesco is the beautiful love child of a cauliflower and a head of broccoli. You can preserve most of this beauty by roasting it whole. That way you can see its fractal pattern in its full glory. Since it's only one tiny genetic step away from a head of cauliflower, if you can't find Romanesco, you can substitute cauliflower for the Romanesco in this whole recipe. In any case, broccoli, cauliflower, and Romanesco are all cultivars of the same taxonomic species. While roasting this vegetable whole makes for a great presentation, it definitely brings some challenges. When we start developing recipes here in the test kitchen, we look at all manner of cooking techniques and equipment. 
so we can make the recipe that we think makes the most sense for home cooks. First, we tried roasting the Romanesco whole straight in the oven in a similar way to our roast broccoli. We used a lower oven temperature to give the interior a chance to cook through. And initially, we were excited to see what came out of the oven, but it didn't work for the same reason as the squash. Even when the outside was well browned, the inside was still underdone. We tried a variety of ways. First, we cooked it covered in the oven using foil. Now this worked, but it took a long time and it was kind of awkward. Next, we tried boiling, which washed out a little bit of the flavor, not terribly, but the outside florets were overcooked before the stem had fully cooked through. And it just wasn't that convenient having to boil a whole pot of water. So we realized we needed a two-step process. One with moist heat to turn the dense stem tender, and a second dry heat stage to give us the browning and the visual appeal that makes roasted vegetables so good. The best option we found was the microwave. It had the best flavor. The results were very similar to oven steaming or conventional steaming. So let's get this into the microwave. I've got a two pound head of Romanesco here. If you can't find one so big, you can always use two smaller ones. I'm gonna add three tablespoons of butter and we're gonna cover it. You could use plastic wrap, but I'm just using a plate here. I'm gonna microwave it until a paring knife slips easily in and out of the core. It'll take eight to 12 minutes for this one, five to seven minutes if you're using two smaller heads. While the Romanesco is microwaving, we're gonna make a quick yogurt tahini sauce. I've got half a cup of whole milk yogurt here. I'm gonna add two tablespoons of tahini, half a teaspoon of grated lemon zest, a tablespoon of the juice, and one minced garlic clove. We're gonna whisk this until combined. We want this nice and smooth. Okay, it looks like there's a few more minutes left on the microwave. I'll get things tidied up, gather some equipment, and we can crack on. All right, this is looking bright green and beautiful. Let's check for tenderness using that paring knife. Yep, that feels pretty good. Now we need to transfer it to a 12 inch oven safe skillet. And we're gonna brush the Romanesco with all of the melted butter that we have from our bowl. It's still a little bit hot, so watch out for that. This will really help with browning in the oven. Now before we've used the oven to roast things, but here we're actually gonna use the broiler. This will help get direct heat to all those little nooks and crannies and get that browning that we're really looking for. We're gonna season it with a quarter teaspoon of salt, and we're gonna broil this until the top is spotty brown. It'll take eight to 10 minutes. While that's broiling, we're gonna make a spiced butter. I've got three tablespoons of butter here, and I'm gonna add that to two teaspoons of a Berbera spice blend. Now, Berbera is an Ethiopian spice blend with about 10 or 11 different spices in it. You can make your own, or you can use store-bought. We're gonna microwave this until it's fragrant and bubbling. This will take one to two minutes, and you wanna give it a stir every so often. Ho oh, ho, this is looking stunning. It's like bright green with all those lovely little brown edges of it. You just know this is gonna be delicious. Now it's always a good tip if you've got something with a very hot handle to just drape a towel on top of it. It just reminds you that you don't wanna to touch it and it will, I guarantee, save you a burn. So I've got my spice butter, which is all melted, it was bubbling. I'm gonna put this straight into the hot pan. Now the milk solids in that hot pan will continue to cook you get almost like a brown butter effect. So now I'm just gonna let it sit there for a sec, tilt it down, and then we're gonna start basting our Romanesco with our spice butter. You just wanna keep on basting it until there's very little butter left in the pan. So now we're gonna transfer this to the board, being careful of the hot handle. I'm gonna garnish it with some pine nuts. I've got a tablespoon of minced cilantro here. This can sit right in the center of any table and it is gonna be impressive. Let's carve and serve. Take myself a nice little quarter. Serve it with some of my sauce. Oh, this looks so good. A few more pine nuts and we are ready to eat. There's so much complexity here. The interior is tender and creamy, and then on top you get all the extra flavor, a little bit of texture from the browning that just gives roasted food so much appeal. And then just gets rounded off with this lovely, creamy tahini. Meat eaters and vegetarians will agree, this is a great dish. I hope you make it. You will feel like a master chef. What sort of veggies do you think you could turn into a main course? Also, what would you like to see me work on next? Let me know in the comments below, hit the like button, subscribe, and for these recipes and so much more, check out americastestkitchen.com.